Hello, I'm AJ. And I'm Shane, and, and you can't hear my glass because I don't have nails. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should grow a pair or ten. Oh, oh. Wow. Welcome to the Liquidity Event, a show about all things personal finance with a laser focus on what? What do we laser focus on? What kind of gin we're putting in our drinks? Dogs. Equity compensation. Uh, I have a special guest with me today. I have uh, Miss Opal. Opal, say hello. <laughs> that is a handsome dog. <laughs> she's a three-year-old bulldog puppy. She still she's still displays puppy characteristics. AJ is desperately trying to prove that she loves animals and dirty dogs. She never like, allows my dog at her house. It's not me that doesn't allow mm, the dog at our house. Mm. Anyways, uh, what are you reading this week, Mr. Mason? The same thing I've been reading since May. Which is what? <laughs> no, it's, that's an exaggeration. That's Sapien's book. It's like the history of human beings. It's pretty cool. It's pretty tight. It's like Guns, Germs, and Steel. It's like mm. a different. It's a different vibe. It's complimentary. Love, love bestseller nonfiction. Yeah. <laughs> My fave. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the before there were podcasts, there was nonfiction bestsellers. That's what we all did before. <laughs> We make podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the four-part history of the world type of vibe. Yeah, exactly. Or, uh, yeah, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, Devil in the White City. Those are good ones. Those would make great podcasts if they're not already. Uh, I'm reading the one-page marketing plan, which is cool. Ooh. Kind of boring. Business book. Business book. Love love to up level is up Is the podcast in there? Is this podcast in the one-page marketing plan? Well, I'm only on chapter two, so I haven't actually written the one-page <laughs> Marketing. Is that my copy of the book? Uh, no, I got my own copy. Oh, what you drinking? <laughs> it is the liquidity event. What what is the what liquidity event are you rocking today? Uh, it is ninety degrees in Brooklyn today, so it's gin and tonic season here. Mm -hmm. Um, so just uh, whatever trash gin is laying around because that's what we mix, right? Uh, I'm not mixing my my <laughs> lovely Plymouth gin. So I got this Green Hook Gin Smiths. Shout that's out to any. Trash. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really good. It's, it's just actually lovely, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> it is lovely. Uh, I'm in California where the citrus is popping off, and I'm having oh a God. orange, lime, and lemon mezcal margarita that is um, with a, a spherical ice cube. Wow, that looks I'm amazing. Very into. Very bougie. Very AJ. Very, yeah. I coordinated yeah. my lipstick, sweatshirt, and drink, and dog. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> very on brand. What is up in the world of finance this week? Hmm. Oh, a lot of things. Look at all these. Look at these bad boys here. We've got a long list of articles to dig through. Shall we get into it? Let's jump right in. Or shall we say, take a dive into a pool? <laughs> is that an Olympics reference? Is that what well, it could be. Yeah, exactly. The Olympics just ended in Japan. An equity pool? Equity comp pool? <laughs> the share pool? Why don't you uh, dish out some of that share pool, uh, some of these articles here? Yeah. I mean, the Olympics just ended in Japan. It seemed USA won, of course, because we always win because we're the best. Go USA. Great effort from all countries. You can win the Olympics? Yeah, you get the most gold. I actually don't, I actually don't know if we got the most gold, but we usually do. <laughs> uh, Jim, can you fact check that? Thanks. There's no Jim. There's no Jim. Opal. Uh <laughs> My favorite story to come out of, it's not even related to the Olympics, it just feels like it, uh, the Pokemon Vaporeon, uh, which evolves from an Eevee, uh, was named as the mascot for International or National Water Day in Japan. So when you want to celebrate Water Day, Vaporeon is going to be your mascot. It's a rad Pokemon. Shane, what was the most recent Pokemon that you caught in Pokemon Go? Uh, I caught a, leg a legendary, which I was just flexing on you just prior to this meeting. Um, this meeting, I, uh, I'm not telling you how I got it okay? because we are hyper competitive. Uh, but it's, it's called a Pailka, Pailka, Pailka. It's not one of the original 150, so I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's not part of the poker rap. I nicknamed it <laughs> internet. Cool. Which is my, it's our favorite thing to do in Pokemon Go, right? Nickname the, the Pokemon. Yep. Yeah. The Pokemon rap. <laughs> Poker rap. Which we'll have to insert here. Uh, a few <laughs> a few bars from the poker rap. <laughs> so wait, so 
circling back to the Vaporeon and the Olympics, we have 113 medals. Second place was China, 88. Third place, Japan. You want to guess fourth place? Russia? Well, I think they got disqualified or something. No one knows anything about the Olympics this year. Poor Japan. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Poor Japan. No, I don't know who fourth is. Canada? The United Kingdom. Yeah. (laughs) Fifth place, another Commonwealth country. Australia. Yes. Nailed it. Look at them. Look at those little Aussies. (laughs) (laughs) Apologies to Australians. You're very intelligent and wonderful people. I think they are my favorite, my favorite country, my favorite citizens. What else we got? We got this, uh, yeah, poor Japan, poor Olympics, rating super low. Up there on the hit list for highest hit uh, countries for, due to COVID, not just <clears throat> due like population wise, but also business wise with the Olympics falling. You know, how often do you get to host the Olympics? Once every 50 years, 100 years? Huge bummer. Yeah, that country's been through a, a lot, you know, massive <laughs> tsunami and nuclear disaster within a, was what, 10 years ago ish? Yeah. COVID, get to host the Olympics. You're on your way to recovery. COVID happens. Bummer. Yeah. Arguably one of the one of the reasons that Brooklyn FI exists is the country of Japan. Our shared love for uh for hentai. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, anime. I can yeah, I meant anime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anime. Dragon anime. Ball Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh so who me. Who do you think the scammer of the week is this week? Great question. Um, great, great softball. As if we didn't talk about <laughs> talk about that before we got started. Obviously, uh, Mr. Andrew Cuomo, uh, governor, former Cuomo, governor of New York, former as, as of what? As of probably the time of this ago? airing. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Out with uh, uh, I actually respected his uh his outgoing speech. Yeah. He was just like, I'm not doing my job here. It's too much distraction on me. I'm going to step away, let someone be the governor of a, of a state that needs some good governance right now. So I respected him for stepping down. I think it took a little too long. But here we are, the first female governor of New York. And it had to happen like this. Yeah, lots of great uh, headlines about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, great scam, right? Da- your dad is governor of the state. You have highways named after your dad, and then you slide into the governorship. Great Fantastic scammer that Mr. that Mr. Andrew Cuomo. Scammer of the week for sure. Oh god, would you call that a good scam or a bad scam? Get becoming governor of New York. Ooh, good question. Mm, I think that he handled COVID very well. Um, do you remember when he was handling the daily briefings and he was one of the governors that was actually taking it seriously and that girl made Cuomo's daddy tote bags that were everywhere floating around i do remember that yes uh those probably aren't selling too well no. right now no no what do you say he's he's not a flirt he's an italian or something yeah well, <laughs> well that's problematic let's not go down that road <laughs> uh okay so t- back to the theme of this podcast which is equity compensation mm. uh robin hood went public mm. uh the meme a- stock is now a meme stock yeah, and it had an incredibly volatile first week. But was what was really unique about Robinhood is that for really the first time ever is that instead of institutional investors and employees and you know hedge funds getting access to the IPO, regular everyday retail investors could buy at the IPO price. So almost thirty percent of the shares were open to your average Joe or Jane investor, and it went pretty well. Stock opened. Where are we at now? Let's take a look at Mr. Robin Hood. How we, ticker ticker symbol Hood. <laughs> yeah, not problematic at, at all. The ticker symbol Hood. Cla- <laughs> classic, uh, classic uh, appropriation there. Um, well, it didn't go too well at the beginning, though, right? What? How's the? How how did hashtag Hood do off the rip? First yeah, so a few days so was down. Yeah, our our 52 week low is 33. 52 week high was was 85. So we hit a nice spike was last week and now we're back down to around 50. And it's been kind of leveling out around 50 for the past couple of trading days. So, you know, if you bought at, if you bought in at IPO at around 30, 35, you did you're doing pretty well. So, you know, not a complete disaster, but not a not a home run like a, a snowflake or something like that. 
There was a lot of dunking on the IPO price that day one and day two of it being down 10 to 20 percent, if I remember correctly. And a lot of people, it's like it's like first impressions with IPOs, right? Like people, you don't, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And like, how much does it really matter what happens on days one to five of an IPO? It's like well, unfortunate if the <laughs> options prices are set at IPO prices and then it experiences a downward shift because of all the employees but and the early investors but you know anyone that listens to this um should know that ipos don't perform nearly as well as the stock market in general right 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 and you know day one of trading can often be statistically one of the highest prices you'll get for years right so sometimes clients come in and they're like i gotta offload five hundred thousand shares you know, we're selling a lot on day one because we don't know what's going to happen, right? We could see an incredibly volatile situation. Let's grab that money. Let's pay the taxes and let's invest it into a real diversified portfolio. Okay. You know so we're, shif- we're shifting over from retail investors to Brooklyn FI clients. Is this, is this? Yeah. To anyone with equity compensation, you know, thinking about divesting out of your, your concentrated position. There were a lot of a lot of Robinhood employees, you know, they were pretty generous generous with their equity plans, according to what I've seen. Pretty cool that their employees got to to exit on day one and the stock's been, you know, it's been bouncing around. There's, I bet there's a lot of regret and chatter in those Slack channels about not selling at 85 now that we're, we're back down to the 50s. Yeah. Uh, so generous with the equity, generous with the, how would you define, is that more of a vibe or is that more of a, there is a, you know, there's 30% of the, of the company is in the option pool or where, where do you fall on that? I would say generous with the equity based on the fact that I know that ownership was important to them and it wasn't, it was available to almost all employees. Whereas sometimes we see you know, employers not give everyone equity and like the admin to, people and exactly the, like the, you know, you the start as a, and the... a year one marketing assistant, you know, you're right out of college, mm. probably not getting equity. You're probably not getting equity till your year two or three. I think from what I've read, Robin Hood was, was, you know, generous with, with that. So I respect that. I bet there are fun studies about equity pool access and performance of the stock long run, right? Like if they're able to provide a larger percentage of the equity pool to key employees, key engineers, key sales reps, et cetera, um, how that impacts the IPO price and the stock price over the long. I mean, it's going to be harder these days to, to, to track that considering how much longer companies are staying private. Palantir, for example, various Elon companies, just companies in, in general are staying private longer. Um, I guess you could try to track, you know, the ever elusive 409A prices, which aren't real prices anyway. Um, and not but public, it, right? That's the, pro- the problem there is that we don't, we don't even get to see historical pricing data until the company goes public. And if there's an acquisition, we may never see it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I would love to see some, some studies on that. I haven't seen anything about uh, equity pool access. If any of our listeners are familiar with uh, uh, tracking prices, and equity pool access, uh, whether that's just key executives versus all the way down the the chain down to you know your level one, you know to your interns. I'm curious if anyone has any resources on that. Yeah. What do you want to talk about next, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. We have the nightmare of changing your residency right here on this list here. Um, this is obviously a lot of meat on this bone. We've been speaking with our, you know, when I say residency, you know, not just these, a lot of people have changed their residency. Uh, we'll call it physically or in reality. Uh, but when it comes to the tax man chasing your tax residency, what does that look like? Those are kind of two different things. Oof, I'm going to try to, I'm going to do my best not to get into webinar mode and talk about this, but we've just been thinking about this a lot lately. And I guess it's top of mind because we went into um, an attorney's office yesterday. John and I and the Brooklyn FI team met with Hodgson Russ, which is a famous state and local tax, aka SALT, which is such a great, great acronym, SALT, state and local tax 
Uh, it works for attorneys and for accountants. And we just met with some of the most brilliant attorneys in the space around state and local income taxes and how, you know, most people don't really think about their state tax impact when they're thinking about exercising options or, you know, they think about their federal tax bills, but they don't think about the states. And there's a lot of value to be exploring, like, what state am I going to be in when I have a taxable event? Sometimes, you know, there's seven states uh, that don't have a state and local income tax. They don't have a state income tax. Yeah, and if you're thinking about moving to Texas, specifically Austin, got to check out our our main our main man Jason wrote a great blog post this week uh, about moving to Brooklyn FI's favorite tax haven, which is Austin, Texas. <laughs> Guide to like neighborhoods and commutes. He put a put a lot of thought into it. He he's lived there for for a while, so check that out if you're thinking about moving to Austin to save on your state income taxes. Yeah. And, like, you know, we've been looking into, you know, we have employees that move from California to Illinois and have New York uh, exposure as well. We've got employees that have obviously moved all over the country, all over the world. And this this rabbit hole just keeps getting deeper and deeper. Like you think that you have it under control. You got, you know, we have 10 New York state residency audits going on at the same time. We walk into the, the state and local income tax attorney's offices and they just turn your uh, t- turn your head, <laughs> just turn it all upside down when you realize how much more complicated it can get, what different types of income are subject to these different rules. There are 50 different, you know, income tax, essentially there's 51 internal revenue codes, you know, there's the federal and then there's the 50 state ones as well. And, and let's not just, forget the localities too. We've got New York city, uh, what's Ohio, uh, uh LA, what, San Francisco. LA. Ohio alone has about 50 different localities yeah. that have their Seattle own. Seattle tax. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's top of mind for me. And But, you know, the article that we're referencing uh, specifically here is the Journal of Accountancy. You know, the IRS put out a famously the Trump tax code, uh, tr- the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act cut the state and local income tax deduction. Uh, they capped it at $10,000. Uh, so you can take a tax deduction for any state taxes that you paid up to $10,000. Historically, before the that Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, TCJA, you could deduct all of your state and local income taxes. So California and New Yorkers could deduct giant tax bills, and then they capped it at $10,000. And the IRS has come in here and said, well, actually, you can form a business, and all of the businesses' state and local income taxes are deductible. So something that we're exploring for all of our high income um, taxpayers is creating an entity, creating a partnership with their spouses and then deducting all of those state and local income taxes that the entity has. So again, not trying to put on the webinar hat and get too far into the, into the weeds here. I see you rolling your eyes. As no, you I'm not rolling my eyes. I'm just, it's, this is such an important topic, especially for, you know, most folks who live in high tax states like New York and California, you know, we, Shane, you mentioned earlier, we, we focus a lot on the federal tax and especially with equity compensation and, and, you know, investing, we talk about, you know, short-term versus long-term capital gains. And, you know, you could be paying 37% if you hold a stock for less than a year, you could, that, that could drop down to 20%. So, you know, we're saving 17%. You could save almost 14% by moving out of New York and capturing that capital gain. So, you know, the, the states do matter and, you know, they're not talked about, like there are not Forbes articles and, you know, very few Reddit posts about what's going on with the states, right? Because we're so focused on the federal because that's complicated enough. And then we add this like state layer on top of it. Then we add COVID and we add employers being flexible with moving around. And it's just, I mean, it's, it's a maelstrom of, of complexity and, and differing opinions, right? We're not going to, this is, this is, this is new territory. So, you know, we're putting what we think is right based on the accounting community on the tax return. But you and I both know that there's going to be, you know, tax court cases coming out for the next decade that's going to, you know, overturn some of this stuff. So, yeah, you know, what the TLDR is, if you live in New York or California, it's going to be really hard for you to escape those taxes unless you're truly, you're out. You're leaving New York City. You sold your apartment. You're moving to Austin, Texas, and that's (laughs) it. And you're not coming back. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, I think there's two different things that two different strategies. If you got a big if you got a, a bunch of income, there's two different things that you want to explore. One is changing your residency. Like I move from this state to another. So I'm subject to different tax rates. And then you have to convince an auditor of New York or California that you actually moved, which means like 
you moved your teddy bears, you moved your whole family, you enrolled in a new school. It's not just a driver's license. Like you have to actually, it has to be painful. Like you got to pack up all your old stuff. You got to break up with your ex and, and move in with your new, your new girl or your new guy. Uh, so there's the residency approach. And then if you're, if you're not approaching that, uh, you have a, the entity approach where you say, all right, these state and local income taxes that I'm paying, how do I actually get a tax deduction for them? Cause I'm not trying to move out of New York or California. Then you can you can create an entity to try to uh, get those deducted. So that's that's what we're focused on. Super these spicy. Days. I, lo- I yeah. love it. Yeah, I love this. Yeah, love you ask it. what we're reading these days, and I come up with a book that gets touched, you know, for the ten minutes before I fall asleep. What I'm really reading these days are all these IRS <laughs> updates, to <laughs> <laughs> state local income taxes, staying on top of that. Sorry, I just want to read my my favorite headline of news item from the week, which is. <laughs> Ooh. Transform your time-sucking vanity advisor podcast into an addictive program. <laughs> Topical. <laughs> Shots fired. Topical. This isn't. This is a vanity advisor podcast. Thank you very much, RA Intel, for that that article. Didn't read the article, so I'm not sure how to transform this <laughs> from a vanity I, podcast into I did. something I read the useful. <laughs> so Shane, what do we, what do we do to make this not a a vanity podcast that yeah. time well, sucks? While, while I'm procrastinating on actually reviewing tax returns, I, I do read these articles. Uh, yeah, it's a great headline. Your vanity podcast. Uh, we love. Yeah. The the gist of the article is that if you want to have a good podcast, you got to make it fun. You have to be authentic. You don't just slap people on the back and do fake chuckles. Uh, I don't think we would ever create something like that anyway. There's supposedly 700,000 podcasts in Apple Podcasts. Um, So if you want to be successful when creating a podcast, you just have to be authentic. Yeah, no surprises there that no one's going to try to no one's going to listen to you. Just uh, try to sell them stuff for for half an hour. And uh, so that's why, you know, we drink on our podcast because it <laughs> it uh, greases the authenticity. It greases the authenticity. <laughs> that's right, baby. <laughs> it authentico. <laughs> um, oh my God, wait, sorry. Speaking of authentico, apologies, that was terrible. Uh, I had the best Mexican burrito I've ever had in my entire wait, life. Wait, what night. is authentico? It was me making fun of my horrible Spanish accent. Authentico, authentic. <laughs> anyway, there's a restaurant here. Unless are Angeles. you going to visit me in Mexico this winter and get your your Spanish back? Perhaps. Quizás, quizás, quizás. <laughs> quizás. There it is. <laughs> quizás. Uh, there's a restaurant in on the east side of LA, kind of near Eagle Rock, called Cacao, and they have this insane birra burrito. It's like a deep fried tortilla with like mm. marinated steak and rice and beans. And then you dip it in the consomme. It's like a Tijuana right. style. Keep it going. Keep oh this commercial God. going. Just This yeah, podcast is brought to you by our sponsors. Our sponsor, Cacao Mexicatessen. Cacao Mexicatessen. <laughs> yeah. oh, AJ got three <laughs> free burritos for that plug. Dude. <laughs> they do not need. AJ's uh, not coming back from California, y'all. Yeah, She's... that's probably not. Uh, yeah, I don't save any taxes by moving here, unfortunately, but uh, that's okay. Well, the citrus is better, so that's good enough reason for me. All right. All right. I think we have time for uh, one one more update. Ooh. Well, you want to talk about, I feel like you should talk about these uh, this bark spec. What's going on with your bark spec situation? I don't mean to hijack. What were you, is that where you were going to, the road you were going to go down? No, no, uh- <laughs> it was not. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, bark. BarkBox uh, went public via a SPAC, meaning a special acquisition company. Another co- It merged with another company to take it public. Um, so now it's publicly traded. Uh, it's been hovering around a price of $9. You know, we've got a lot of, of longtime loyal employees who are really excited about this liquidity event. Uh-huh. That's why we're here, right? This chance to, to extract some dollars from this company that they've put a lot of hard work into. But... You know, SPACs are great. They look, it's a great way to take your company public, but in reality, they're very messy, right? There's a lot of paperwork and conversions and shares moving around between one transfer agent and another, and then eventually ending up at the bank or the investment bank. And it's just been really difficult for employees and for us as advisors to to get through this, honestly. Um, and it's been, it's been really frustrating. Um, because, you know, you think you're ready to go. The trading window opens. Everything's good. You, you log into your account. You think you can trade. And then we find out, you know, we're not able to trade for X reason. And we don't want to run afoul of insider trading laws. So, 
you know, we pull back. So just kind of a, a PSA for anyone going through a liquidity event, your company's going public via SPAC, be prepared for a lot more surprises than you might. Yeah, just be prepared for a lot of surprises. Be, be prepared for delays, getting on the phone, medallion signatures on, uh, you know, pieces of paper that tell you how many shares you own. Uh, you know, when, when, when the company goes public via SPAC, there's a conversion. So a bunch of accountants and lawyers get together in a room and decide what the conversion rate is going to be. So then we got to convert all your shares beforehand into the new number of shares, got to divide the, your strike price by that same conversion. It's just, it's just a clusterfuck, honestly. And I, I wish that they so the official. Were, were easier, but they're not. So SPAC is a, is a scam in my book. It's a bad mm. scam. That's your, <laughs> that's your summary. <laughs> oh, I got a perfect segue off of that. Speaking of scams, uh, I just found a, a, a set of the original 150 Pokemon cards in one binder. It's $3,600. I don't know if this is. Any shiny ones? Uh, well, they didn't hologram? do shiny back then. This no, is pretty shiny. No, the hologram ones. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. So, no, is that where you think they got shiny from? Yeah, for sure. Okay, I got one more before we wrap things up. Okay. Uh, So today there was an amendment that got passed to the infrastructure bill. Mm. It was a pretty big blow to electric vehicle owners or potential owners. A Uh, lot of Tesla purchases happening to Brooklyn. Yeah, I have written very mixed feelings about this. So yeah, the a bill or sorry, an amendment passed that would restrict the. Uh, the federal credit. So currently, if you buy an electric vehicle, I think you get a $7,500 just tax credit, right? Right off the rip. Um, mm-hmm. Now well, they're going to... Uh, essentially. That? Yep. No, you yep. got it. Yeah. Um, but now they're going to limit it to in two ways. One is if your income is more than $100,000, you don't get the credit. And they're also limiting it to electric vehicles that cost less than $40,000. So that eliminates the Tesla's of the world, right? And why why do, why are they doing that? They're doing it because they don't think it's fair because they think that the wealthy are benefiting from this tax credit. And they're saying that if you can afford to buy a $65,000 Tesla, you know, why are you getting a tax credit? You should be you should be paying that tax. I have mixed feelings because, you know, tax credits are incentives and if you're deciding between a What's a gas guzzling car, you know, like an expedition and a oh, Tesla. I see. I see. And, you know, you're just in general, I think climate change is one of the greatest crises that we're facing right now. So I, I have mixed feelings about this where. Is this a I Republican like it. or a Democrat? It that... was a Republican led bill, but three Democrats voted for it. Or so I could see how it comes from both sides, right? The Republican yeah. is saying we don't want to benefit rich people. Not very, dem- not very Republican traditionally. But they're benefiting gas guzzlers, Republican, conservative, traditionally. Interesting. Yeah, it's basically yeah. an anti. It's an anti. It's a pro-global warming. <laughs> Hot bill, take. It's, Hot uh-oh. take. Here there will be blood. Really straddles the conservative oil man, conservative, mm. but also P. Uh, but loves milkshakes, so therefore is loves. Like, what's his name? Anderson. P. T. Anderson. Forget. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> We're so old. <laughs> oh man! But no, like this is this is an example of like I don't know government, like how it's so important who your elected officials are, right? Like here we got this bill. Like I don't. When I saw this headline, I thought like, was this oh, a this Dakota is... senator? Uh, I think this is a North or South Dakota Arizona. Senator. Oh, Arizona. Hmm, interesting. Oh wait, no, that's just a photo of somebody. I don't know. Yeah, no, I thought this. I thought this uh, bill came from a. Dakota senator, which has just as many, a state that has just as many senators as New York, just as a reminder, <laughs> and California. Which Dakota, north or south? Actually, it has more if you combine them together. It has I four. Saw a, I saw this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I saw a silly uh, proposal from someone on Twitter to combine the Dakotas and to add Puerto Rico. That way we don't have to, <laughs> we don't have to change the number of stars on the flag. <laughs> Perfect. We call it Mega Coda. Um, Anyway, politics are silly. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's interesting, like, in in the coastal elite cities. You know, it's funny, I had this conversation with my sister, who has, who has an electric car. She has a, a Leaf, I think. It's awesome. It's totally silent. Um, and, you know, we were kind of, like, arguing off the 
the rep, she's like, you know, well, there's so many electric vehicles on the road. And I was like, well, what do you think the percentage is of electric vehicles on the road? And I forget what she said. I think she said something like 25%. Oh, and no I was way. like, there's no way. It's got to be like less than 1%. I think it's about 2%. Um, I'm sorry. It's, it's actually less than 1%, but um, less than 2% of new vehicles being manufactured are electric. So it's still, this is a tiny percentage of people. And we have to assume that the people who are able to make this choice are going to be the rich people. So why should the rich people get the tax break when we really need everybody to stop buying gas guzzlers and move over yeah. to the, the EV space? It's a tough one. Yeah, we you know we want as many EVs on the road as possible so that the earth doesn't uh, melt like a popsicle in the year 2060. Uh, but we also need a progressive tax system. So a lot of gray area here. She's from Nebraska. First mm. uh, female U.S. senator from Nebraska, Republican. Mm. Are you gonna get a Tesla? <laughs> I can. I'm a more of a Mesla. <laughs> <laughs> oy, oy <vey. laughs> How's your Peloton? Is that oh, does that man. feel like a Tesla? Are you uh, generating energy for the LA grid over there? I don't know. I'm I'm a Peloton convert. I, I mean, I was never against Are you a, it. You're a Pelistan. I'm a Pelistan. Oh God. It's incredible, go. honestly. So I've been <laughs> not only have I been on the Peloton, I've been Did you call me from the Peloton earlier? Did you I called you from the Peloton me? earlier? <laughs> but the Peloton. in the Peloton app, you can coordinate with your friends. So you can take a Peloton class with your friend and you can video chat right in the Peloton app. So my friend Emily and I have been hanging out in the mornings for like half an hour, like while we're in this class, catching up. Oh, it's social. It's social. I think they're I think that might be a new feature. Uh, cause obviously it would be pretty, uh, invasive if you're on your Peloton. <laughs> I need you random. to bring more homework. I need you to do your homework on this podcast, AJ. Some is it random social? guy <laughs> pops up and is like, want a video chat? Like that would not be a good outcome for me. <laughs> oh, so you can get cat called on the Peloton? Uh, you can get high fived, which is not necessarily that's a cat call. A cat call. <laughs> that's a, that's a poke. That's a Facebook poke. I mean, they can't poke. see you. <laughs> yeah. It's a poke. It's, it's a version of a poke. A, do you have a profile? You have a profile, but and most people put pictures and you have like a hashtag of like, you know, spinning and winning or whatever. So you can put a photo of yourself and someone can high five you based on the photo. I mean, you're supposed to like high five everyone in the app. class to like. It's a dating app. You know, I mean, the fact that they haven't made it a dating app is a missed opportunity. Peloton, if you're listening, I got some they good know. ideas for you. They, they know. know. Of course they know. They're trying to figure it out right now. Well, any final thoughts on this week's clusterfucks? That's my favorite word. I love that word so much. You're just going to sprinkle that in there? Yeah. You're just going to spread the clusterfuck seeds around this podcast and see what grows into the future? <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things, speaking of politics, is the hashtag Biden inflation. Uh, first of all, I love how little I think about the president these days. That's so funny. I was I, having the exact same conversation last night. Yeah. But uh, somebody in that same article around uh, electric vehicles, somebody, tried, I guess the Republicans are trying to pu push push this hashtag Biden, infl <laughs> Biden inflation, which it should just be Biden inflation. They do. They actually spell out his name all the way. So it's Biden inflation. So it's, it's Biden it's, inflation. Yeah, it's, too yeah, it's a little bit too mouthy. <laughs> yeah, if they wanted it to work, they should have just called it Biden inflation. Biden inflation. I don't know. Anyway, so at inflation? used cars, <laughs> inflation's back is the whole <laughs> inflation scares people. Mm -hmm. Does not does it scare you, AJ? Are you afraid? I'm of not inflation? afraid of inflation. No? At all. No. Oh, my God. Inflation is the whole reason for this last article from Venezuela, the Planet Money podcast, about old school RuneScape, wherein... Folks that live in Venezuela, because inflation is so rampant, one of the few ways that they can make money that in U.S. dollars is to play an old online video game where they just mine gold. You make like five dollars a day, but it's in U.S. dollars, and they can do it on their old computers in Venezuela because it's old school RuneScape from the game's like twenty years old, so you can run it on like a cell phone. And there's all these old diehard players that continue to play, and they created this guild. And they just like all these Venezuelans running around speaking Spanish and like 
<laughs> killing all the other players and stealing their gold. <laughs> It's an amazing, just like a quick so twenty-minute like, podcast. It's like World of Warcraft meets Bitcoin yes. mining. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So there's a little, and that's that's what happens when inflation, when Biden inflation runs rampant through the United States. We'll all be mining Russian rubles. No, Shane, you and I are gonna be way ahead of the game because we're gonna be playing Pokemon <laughs> Go and we're gonna be winning. <laughs> we'll be selling our ultra that's balls. That's gonna be the new currency of the future. The the Nana berries and the raz, razzle dazzle berries, <laughs> golden raspberries on Pokemon Go. There's no inflation in Poke Go. Cool. Well, always great to see you. Mm. Do we do a sign off? Yeah. Razzle dazzle. May you fare thee well. May you catch legendary Pokemon. Farewell your, and adieu. You fair Spanish lazies. Portfolio be diversified. Have a great week, everyone. Workshop. Like, that subscribe, one. listen wherever. Our website oh is brooklynfi.com slash episode three. This is the third mm. episode. That's how you find the show notes. We'll link to the articles we talked about, but most importantly, we will link to Cacao Mexicatessen where you can have this killer. Got to get those burritos. Otherwise, AJ doesn't get paid. <laughs> Use her referral code. A-Y-J-A-Y. <laughs> Hashtag 4269. Sorry, this is a, this is a bit of a tangent, but uh, <laughs> one time I made a reservation at a restaurant. Oh, here we go. For AJ. And AJ's I guess I put restaurant in, stories. I put in, I Just guess I put in bonus. a lowercase, lowercase J. So it was Anyone AJ. Anyone that subscribes to Stitcher <laughs> Premium gets the AJ restaurant. And, bathtub and the, the hostess, stores. we're sitting outside waiting for the table, having a glass of wine. The hostess comes out and she goes, Aj, party of two, Aj. So now there's a, a segment of my friends that call me Aj. So always capitalize your letters and your name if you have a two, sil- two character name like AJ. I'll see you next week, Aj. <laughs> see you later, Sean. Everyone oh, calls you, you Sean. I'm going to call you Sean. Later, Sean. No, it's not even funny. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.